Welcome to Pilates Teacher's Manual, your guide to becoming a great Pilates teacher. I'm Olivia, and I'll be your host. Join the conversation and the Pilates community on Instagram at Pilates Teacher's Manual, and visit buymeacoffee.com slash Olivia Podcasts to support the show. Today's chapter starts now. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I am absolutely thrilled today to be on the podcast with Joy Puleo, who is incredible first and foremost. She is a nationally certified Pilates teacher. She is also the director of education at Balanced Body, which is neat because I learned on Balanced Body equipment. I have a Metro IQ reformer and an exo chair, (laughs) um, and Balanced Body is awesome in my book. Um, And I also had the pleasure of attending her workshop this past October when Pilates on Tour visited Chicago, and I got to meet you in person briefly. I know you meet tons of teachers, but it was fantastic then and fantastic to chat with you now. So thank you so, so much for being on the show. Oh, no, thank you, Olivia. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, what a treat. So let's dive in. Can you tell me a little bit about your first Pilates experience? What happened? What was it like? When was that in the wild? (laughs) <laughs> it's so funny you say in the wild, because I always say out in the wild. And by out in the wild, I mean literally where, where we're teaching inside of studios, because that's where the magic happens. So my first experience, I was working, I was working um, for a physical therapist, and she opened this amazing facility that had deep water pools, and there were warm pools. And I was working as an exercise physiologist, and we were getting clients in the pools, and they were, and they were, they were pain-free. And so we kept, we kept thinking, how are we going to get people out of the water? And how are we going to get them pain, keep them pain-free out of the water? And uh, Pilates kept coming up over and over and over. So finally, I took a session. And I took a session with a woman by the name of Connie Borho, um, who many of you probably out there listening may, may know. Uh, she's been in the industry a long time. And it was love immediately. Um, immediately went, signed up for my first teacher training. And I was fortunate enough to get into a studio that was eclectic and sort of this laboratory for movement inside of New York City. At the same time, I was taking my master's degree in physiology. So I had this research going on in my brain and I had all of this literally crawling around on the floor and rolling and doing some Bartendia fundamentals, which we then wove into Pilates and in, in, a, in a studio in New York City, and, and my brain was just popping with creativity. And that's, I think, what I really hope to bring. Like you came to, to my course in October. That's the kind of stuff that, that I hope to bring to my courses is that same sort of curiosity and that, that, that mind-opening experience. So it was love at first movement, which happens to, I think, a lot of people in Pilates, whether it's on the reformer. People are like, what the heck is this? I want to do it every day for the rest of my life. Um, What specifically inspired you to be a teacher? Because you had a career, like you're doing your master's in physiology. You don't just like stumble into that. You have made some like really concerted effort to pursue this. You're working in physical therapist's office. What about Pilates was like, well, I also, I really want to teach this. All right, so I'm going to answer that in two parts. So the first part is I started my master's degree because I had become a personal trainer. And as a personal trainer, I was very disappointed in the the level and the expectation on the level of education because again, I was curious and I wanted to know more because I wanted to help people feel empowered in their physical space the way I did through movement. So just real briefly, I was pretty inactive as a kid. I was very, very big, overweight for a long time. And one day I stopped dieting and I said, I'm just going to feel better in my physical being. And it was through exercise that I empowered myself. And, and for those of you who know me, you know I am so not the perfect Pilates messenger, right? I'm not superhuman and I don't have a superhuman body. I just, I'm a regular person who realizes the benefit of this very thing that we're doing, which is movement. And my tool... I chose was Pilates, but I started as a personal trainer. And so I, I, I was, I was un- dissatisfied. I went to get my master's degree. 
but it was Pilates that turned my mind and showed me how to use sort of the science and the research to really pair with that experience, that physical empowerment that comes with awareness, that the the mind-body connection, the integration of breath, and a whole body systemic look at how our bodies adapt. That's our humanness, right? It's in adaptation. And it's through Pilates that all of that started to make sense to me. And that's why I was like, you know what, if I'm going to do this, Pilates is going to be my tool. That resonates with me. I had a similar experience where I was working in a studio and I was actually filming the person who was leading a teacher training at this little studio in Hyde Park. And something about the way the teacher was talking about movement and the way it was lighting up the people who were doing it, because I came to Pilates from yoga. And I was like, there's some depth in this Pilates system. There's something here that, you know, I didn't find in other movement modalities as much. So I completely hear what you're saying. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. Well, Olivia, I mean, like, think about that because we as human beings, like we try to, we try to codify everything, every movement, every idea, every exercise very specifically, but there's something, there's just something that cannot be explained because we're so dynamic and we're so unique. And we all have our own experiences that we bring to every interaction. And there's something about Pilates that helps us just, just get just slightly behind that to lower the curtain or lower the protectiveness or lower the anxiety around experimenting about being inside our own bodies. And that there's something very special to that. I think about clients that I'm working with who are in their 80s and they're doing things like maybe not full front splits, but they are standing on the reformer and holding onto the foot bar or right. um, one client who's worked for so long to find that balance point and teaser. And it's been so mystifying, but she's found it and how exciting that is. The fact that this system, what we teach can meet people wherever they are, whatever their goals are from you know, very general, I just want to get into exercise. I know exercise is good and my doctor says I should do it to people who just want to take off and will probably be Pilates teachers themselves. That That's absolutely magical. And being part of it, I think, is something really lucky that we get to do in the Pilates industry is be part of those moments for our clients and for ourselves. Right. So then you asked me then, then you know, what made me decide to want to be an instructor. And, and listen, I made the, I've made this sort of my life's work, right? This is what I do. I'm a, I'm a Pilates instructor. And, and that comes because when you do find that, I mean, that magic is in there for every person. And it's like you said, you meet them where they're at and you find those moments for them. That, that gives them the sense that instead of saying, I can't, or leading with I can't, there's a, well, maybe I can, or, you know, and, and that, that's change. That's how you create change. So tell me a little bit about your teacher training experience, your teacher training process. What uh, was your program like? I know that a lot of people who listen are maybe looking at Pilates teacher training programs and mm-hmm you know, modules or weekend intensives or deep dives? What was your training experience like? Uh, Mine was a bit immersive. Originally, I started with the Physical Mind Institute, and it was was in this really interesting period in the mid to late 90s where there were very few teacher training, codified teacher trainings. And so we were just coming out of the apprenticeship era, and it was just before the full-on teacher trainings, and this was one of the first ones. And it was um, it was done over a period of, uh, of of weeks, and we were we were introduced to the system, the Pilates system. So at each each time we got together, it was mat reformer um, and apparatus all sort of woven into an experience. But I am going to tell you that my instructors, um, it felt like. I went to graduate school for Pilates before I went to Pilates school. And we did, uh, there were times in which 
we would do things and I would think, is this even Pilates? Like, what are we, what's going on here? And, and words like fascia were never mentioned, but were always like implied in the movements and in the experiences. It was very experiential. It was um, very much tapped creativity. It sort of shied away from, from overly codifying and allowing you to have your own experience. Um, we've then moved into, we moved into the teacher training era where, where we were like, okay, well now that sort of esoteric approach was terrific when you really could immerse people in it. We're in a different learning environment. So now, and, and not to put too fine a point on it, um, I wasn't a dancer or an intuitive mover when I came. So I had to learn those, those pieces. Um, I had the academic side, but I didn't have the sort of that, that sensory, you know, kinesthetic awareness. But then, you know, what's happening is people fall in love with it and they want to teach and it becomes a second career for some, or now we're really getting full blown, like right out of the gate, this is what I want to do as a career. How do you teach the essence that is Pilates? It's a very interesting question. And, and so we've started to, to, you know, we've created manuals and um, we've created levels and we've created testing junctures. But I think we have to do a little better uh, because the more we can root ourselves, you know, in some ways, I think we have to go back a little and reach back into those little moments, those esoteric moments of exploration, of self-awareness. Because if this is to stay a mind-body modality, and if it's to stay really sort of anchored and rooted in some of the specialness that is Pilates, yes, we have to have all of the structure, but in and around that structure, we have to invite in the curiosity. I think you're on to something because it's always... Because being a teacher is a process. You have to know the exercises. You have to know the spring settings and the choreography and what might be going on in people's bodies. Like there's a lot of stuff you have to know. But then the art of teaching is taking Correct. all of that that you know and then sometimes it does not look like Pilates, but that's what that right. person needs or that's what would really suit them in that moment or maybe – you know, you didn't even learn this version of the exercise, but you think this person is going to really connect with the equipment if you grab something and put it there. But I can see also, you know, as the director of education, like there has to be tests, there has to be a baseline knowledge that you Correct. that you have. Correct. But but yeah, having that space to play, feeling that freedom to play, because you know, once you do your test out, suddenly like you're out in the world and there's people who's, because I always say that like the hardest part about teacher training is you're teaching other Pilates teachers most of the time. And so they know where the foot bar is. They know how to change the springs. And if it doesn't Try work, they'll let you know. Try teaching that to a brand new person. Teach it to a person. brand new person who's yes. like, what's yes. a foot bar? And you're yeah, like, all right. hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, that's why I stay in practice. Um, it's been quite busy lately at Balanced Body. It's been hard to, to stay in private practice, but I've been really, you know, it's really important to stay in practice and not forget those things that when you say to someone, you're going to put those straps on your feet, they, they, they think, where? <laughs> uh, quick story. I was uh, teaching some, a class of very new people to the reformer, and I had never in my life thought that putting the box on the reformer suggested any other box position other than with the part, like the flat bit on top, you know, that you sit on and things. Someone put on, put on the box upside down, got in it like a bathtub, totally committed, <laughs> did not think that there is, they're like, look, this is all strange. I'm down. You said get in the box. I'm in the box. And I was like, please get out of the box. Let's right, flip right. that and, for and, you. And let's, let, let's quantify relative to strange, right? They walk into a Pilates studio. That's These things are, are strange to begin with. Why wouldn't you sit inside of the box? Makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. Um, I'm totally with you on that. So I love this point that we want to be in touch with people who are doing Pilates because we have our own personal experience, especially if you do Pilates over years, you mm -hmm. have a very deep and nuanced perspective of Pilates, what you're working on, what's challenging for you, what you want to explore. Um, and then you've got people who come in off the street who yep. 
like you said, may not be intuitive movers, may not have exercised, or maybe their idea of what exercise is was more that personal training route, more, you know, push yourself, do a thousand reps, don't be able to move the next day, which is not (laughs) my style of Pilates. So thinking back to you when you were a fresh face Mm. out of teacher training, tell me what you were like as a new teacher and then how that has evolved over your years of teaching. Very good question. On some level, so me now, I move a lot more than I did when I was younger. Isn't that funny? When we started and when, uh, again, you know, I, I worked with a physical therapist. We worked with people in pain. We broke everything down. And we took everything really slowly. Uh, when I came out, I, I also I also started a, a studio n- not soon after finishing my teacher training in um, a suburb of New York City. And so my clients were brand new to Pilates, and they would say, "Oh, you know this pilot stuff. I hear it's great for flat abs," and and they were interested in it, but they didn't know what it was. And I was a new student, and I was uncomfortable in trusting what it was. I also was not classically trained. And at that time, there was a real dichotomy again with the classical world and the contemporary world. And I, I had sort of this um, prehab, if you will, mentality. So, so um, at first, I started to take everything really, really slowly. And I realized though these clients are coming in. They want to work out. They want to move. They want to feel and they want to understand what this Pilates is. Maybe what I need to do is trust the work. So what, that's what I did. As I, I started to trust the work, and I started to just, I started to, to, you know, I would always say, let's give them a little of what they want and keep infusing it with what they need. And soon enough, they were coming in for what they needed, not what they thought they wanted. And what they started to come in for was truly Pilates. So basically, I had to get out of my own way in the beginning. Like I was too heady. I was too oriented around joint mechanics. I was too concerned about making sure I was the authority on every little like ache and pain that a client came in with. And I think I was really my own way scared because I didn't sort of trust that I could keep people safe inside of this environment. But now me, as I've, as, as I've, I've grown, the first thing, the first place I go is I trust the system, right? I, I trust the system and my confidence in that then comes through and then my client trusts. And it's inside of that space that you can explore. Um, and that's when it really opens up. But it's, it's, you got to get first, it, it goes back to what you were saying. You've got to get past sort of the knowing of what springs do I use? And uh, how do I baseline cue the choreography? Because once you know that, then you can talk about how do I enrich the choreography? How do I offer options that fit this body in front of me? And then from that comes the creativity of where you can go in terms of training that specific person or that group that's in front of you. I think that is a pretty normal experience coming out of teacher training that, you know, at first your manuals are like a shield and you hide behind them. And, you know, there's so much good stuff in your manuals. And every time I go back to my manuals, I was like, oh my gosh, I completely forgot this was in here. Like there's gold in here that I- I still do. I still do. (laughs) Skipped over and was just like, I'm never going to use that. Um, (laughs) There was some exercise that I even remember in my teacher training that was like, oh, well, we don't really do that one was like head front or something. And now, Mm -hmm. you know, I've played with it and I'm like, actually I can, like I could do head front if I wanted to. That was one of the joys of of teaching teacher trainings is I would go into a manual, right? And we would do reformer three and I would think, oh my God, am I ever going to get my clients to do reformer three? And then we would go through these exercises and we would break them down and we would build them up. And and every time I would leave saying, I love reformer three, I'm going to teach whatever. I'm going to teach variations of snake to everybody this week. And even if I had to do variations where their feet are on the floor or I could get them to the full expression of snake, it was, it, it, you know, it's, it's so important because I think we too put ourselves in a box of what we think someone can do. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually teaching that feet on the floor snake variation like all the time because it's, it's so cool. Yeah, and then it gets, and I think 
what you said about being confident in the system and trusting Pilates to work because we know it does. And I think also this process of beginning to trust our clients to know themselves and to know what they want to explore. Sometimes we look at clients and we think, ah, you could definitely do this. But if that's not the direction they want to go, then we don't really need to push there necessarily. But if they know, you know, hey, this plank thing's really cool. I'm like, planks? We can plank every which way. Let's go. <laughs> um, and that's really exciting. And I think that process of, you know, gripping really tightly to what you know, and then slowly letting go and really giving space for people to have that experience that we know is so powerful that, you know, if we are busy justifying what we're teaching to our clients instead of just letting them move and feel it and, you know, ask questions, you know, that's, for me, that's been my experience as well, that I was like, oh no, only what's in the manual. And I'm like, hey. Yeah. Letting, letting go and giving space is where the magic happens. Right. And, and so you have to feel enough, confident enough in what you have to offer and give. It's really sort of a difference in between sort of having that sort of fearful new instructor mentality um, and just sort of having this seeing an openness in front of you and potential in front of you and, and, and being willing to go into that space. And your clients will follow you. They will absolutely follow you. And it's that process that occurs because you're teaching, because you are getting feedback from your students. You are talking with other teachers. You're workshopping things. You know, it happens in community. It's not like, well, you can just skip that and be totally confident. Like, you got to put in your hours, put in your time, and you'll see what works. You see what doesn't. You realize that, you know, if you don't check your note card every single time you cue footwork, that it's going to be okay. They're still going to do footwork. Um, <laughs> Like And you trust yourself and trust that you know things to do. And it's easy to say after you've taught for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, but I know it can seem daunting when you are right out the gate looking at these people, looking at you very expectantly, <laughs> and looking for this, I love pilots thing, this pilots thing that the seems pilots cool. Thing. Yeah, it gives you flat abs. You know what, what's funny is when I first started, uh, so I, I'm, I'm with Balanced Body in-house for 10 years. Before that, I was doing teacher trainings out of my studio in New York. And, and, and it started off with this pilots thing. And when I started at Balanced Body, I got my email address, which is joy at pilates.com. Feel free to email me. And I used to always have to spell Pilates. It would, I would say joy at Pilates, P-I-L-A-T-E-S dot com. Now, when I give my email address, I say joy, J-O-Y, at Pilates.com and they get Pilates no problem. <laughs> so, so it shows you a bit about how, you know, Pilates is here. We've, we, we've come to that place where clients seek it out because they understand what its value to general well-being. So we don't have to be anything other than Pilates instructors because that's enough. Several teachers who I've had on the podcast have echoed that sentiment that oh, you know, well, I'm a Pilates teacher, but, you know, I also have a day job or I also have this, you know, other thing or I'm also, you know, a physical therapist or I'm also a massage therapist or I'm also a yoga teacher. Um, and I think really leaning into this identity as a Pilates teacher and not needing, I mean, if you want to do other things, that's totally fine, but not thinking that you're incomplete if you Correct. are a Pilates teacher, like you Correct. have skills, you do great stuff. Um, and it's important, you, a, you have lives. a profession and you change people's lives. Yes, it's a, a long time since I left my studio, and and I'm still in contact with many of my original clients. So if if I'm in practice, what well, was it, 17 years prior to coming to Balance Body? So it's now 27 years, and we're still we're still in contact with each other around health and wellness and the and genuine love of movement and Pilates. <laughs> Hi there. I hope you're enjoying today's chapter so far. There's great stuff coming up after the break too. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening and visit buymeacoffee.com slash Olivia Podcasts to support the show. There you can make a one-time donation or become a member for as little as $5 a month. 
Membership comes with some awesome perks, including a shout out in the next episode, a monthly newsletter, a monthly Zoom call with me, and more. You can also visit links.oliviabioni.com slash affiliates to check out some sweet deals on products I use and love. Now back to the show. So you've segued so beautifully into this. So um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your Pilates path. You were doing your master's mm. in physiology or physiology, yeah, physiology, yeah. yes. And then you find this magical Pilates thing, and then you go <laughs> off over here, and now you're at Balanced Body. Tell me about this, you know, journey of Pilates land. Um. Early journey, or or because I feel like it's many chapters. <laughs> I, I think that that shows how wonderful and yeah. uh, varied so, your experience is. But it's just like a little roadmap yeah, because so, once so, you've been yeah, there, you can so, look back. When I so I when I we originally started working with this uh, physical therapist, but but uh, September 11th happened, and uh, it was after September 11th that I said, you know. Um, I want to devote my time to Pilates very specifically. And I opened up a studio and I, and I want to tell you, I opened up a studio, literally I put a sign out the front door. Of course, it was right around the time that we were having all the trademark, the lawsuit around the trademark. So of course I put up, the name was Bodywise. I put up Bodywise Pilates Studio within 24 hours. I got a cease and desist letter and I thought, oh my God, this Pilates world is crazy. Like, what is this? But I did what I, what I do. I kind of just ignored it. I just opened my doors and within a week, my book was full. My personal book was full. And it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with Pilates was really on the ascendancy. And the word Pilates, you know, whether they called it pilots or not, they understood it was something that they wanted. It was a transition in the Pilates world. And many of those clients, when I looked at my book, when I left... I keep forgetting exact percentage, but it's somewhere between 60 and 72% of the people on in my it, it, that I still was seeing once, twice, three times a week were the people who walked in my door that first week. That says a lot about the retention of Pilates clients and the love the client has of the work. And it was always the client that kept this moving and churning. So that was one, one like pivotal time was just saying, I'm opening up my studio. I'm going to make this my profession. Um, I would say another, another pivotal moment was, was when I started a not-for-profit. Um, I had a friend who uh, died of cancer. And um, I said, you know what, I, let's, let's see if what we're, we're, we're seeing, we're doing for our clients every single day in our studios, if that can translate to empowering someone who is, is going through the, the journey of cancer. And um, I was fortunate enough to have clients who, who had various levels of connections, and I was able to work inside of the Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, the Dubin Breast Health Center. And seeing clients from both the Upper East Side, which is a wealthy part of, of Manhattan, and also clients from the sort of the project areas in and around the, the southern part of the Bronx. And it was life-changing for me. And it made me realize that, again, just stepping back, trusting the journey, trusting the work, you're going to hear common themes come out, being present for someone at a time when they feel most vulnerable was enough. Didn't matter if they ever did elephant or stomach massage perfectly or um, ever got into any one of the number, numerous positions of any of our Pilates exercises that we know from the manuals. It was being present, meeting them where they were, offering them a movement modality that met them in their space, and encourage them to explore what they were still capable of, even when dealing with cancer. Uh, and it was powerful. And, and I think that's, that's something that has that transformed me as a teacher. It makes it, you know, you came to my menopause class. Met the, I love the menopause class because 
we are an ever-changing, dynamic, fluid environment and understanding that change happens in the tissues <clears throat> is not so dissimilar to meeting a cancer patient where they are. It is certainly not dissimilar to meeting a client when they walk in the door, regardless of where they are on their longevity spectrum. Um, we, can, we can meet them. We can support them. We can help them move into a space where they feel more confident inside of their bodies. That's powerful. I think one of the reasons that people come into Pilates sometimes or one of the things that I hear over and over again is, you know, I want to improve my posture, you know, I want to stand straighter. And as much as Pilates makes you stronger and more flexible, which it definitely does, I think the posture change comes a lot of times because people feel good about themselves. They feel from the inside. Yeah, they feel it's amazing. The they feel like yeah. a rock star and they stand like a rock star, not because I did some, you know, magical trick on them. They just did things and changed the way they saw themselves, and that changes the way that they interact with the world. I think that's such a gift that you gave the people that you worked with, or you, you didn't really give them the gift. You just kind of opened the doors and let them they, they, explore, they which is yeah. the gift, right? But like you said, when people are feeling vulnerable, when people are feeling small, when they're feeling weak, um, my mom, for example, uh, just had a hip replacement and has been you know, down on herself about the things that she can't do, but she's starting to see that this work that she's putting in in physical therapy is manifesting and being able to climb stairs and being able to you know, get in and out of bed unassisted, which you know, a few weeks ago was not possible. So all movement workers have this you know, capacity to heal even beyond our movement modality, I think you really touched on it when you said this idea of holding space and being mm -hmm. present with the person. Because life isn't all sunshine, daydreams, and rainbows. Like hard things happen. And to have something like Pilates that you can look forward to, that you know makes it better, even if, like you said, especially working in physical therapy, there's people in chronic pain and that pain may mm -hmm. not go away. But creating a container or a space for them to explore what does feel good, what they can do, and really emphasizing that and whatever growth happens, like celebrating and cheering for our clients as they, you know, go through their process is, is amazing. As a society, I think we, we focus on the can't. And... In some ways, because, and this kind of goes full circle to where we started, but uh, sort of the esoteric nature of, of, of walking into a Pilates studio, right? I mean, the, even today, people will walk into a room full of reformers or see a trap table and be like, what is that? Um, something about that requires letting go, requires trusting, and it, it explores the possibility of what you can do. It, it just, you know, I really, uh, you know, we could study mind, the, the value of mind-body fitness and why it works and how it works, but there's something right there that turns the brain and the body trusts and, it, and off you go. It's, it, it's, it, it is quite unique and there's an essence here. And if we can, if we can not forget, and if we can just keep trusting that, this continues to grow in the hearts and the minds of the client. And it's the client who keeps this growing and growing and growing. Back to your lovely roadmap adventure. Um, <laughs> how did you transition or when did you start leading teacher trainings? How did that come about even before Balance Body? So uh, I, I had little kids and it was impossible for me to continue to go into the city. I wanted to study with so many people. I had the, the, the you know, New York City at the time when I was doing my teacher training, um, had an opportunity to spend some time with Irene Dowd. Um, there were really, you know, several, like, people that we today consider the masters, right? They were all working in the city at the time. And it was so hard to get into the city to, to just immerse myself so I said, well, the best way for me to learn then is to teach. Because in the teaching, I need to expand my thinking. 
And I was fortunate. I had my master's degree and that opened a lot of doors. And I started teaching teacher trainings almost immediately for the Physical Mind Institute. And um, it was in, inside of that that uh, I, I would say my, my, my greatest growth came from just being in that learning environment. And, you know, it was funny. It, it's, it's when you, when you, when you're teaching teachers, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's a different experience, but you, you still need to remember to start at the beginning. And in the meantime, to offer, to, to give offerings that inspire the next question. And so that was, that was the beginning uh, of, of my growth there as a teacher. And I knew, I knew early on that teaching teachers was, was a space I wanted to be in. Uh, and then um, I left Physical Mind Institute, and, and and seriously, as I left the Physical Mind Institute, I thought, oh, you know, what am I doing? Like, uh, but I wasn't sure where where that was headed for me uh, personally. And literally, literally, like a little angel on my shoulder, I got a call from Al Harrison, who at the time was a, along with his wife Nora St. John, the directors of Balanced Body Education, and he said you know, we're starting this teacher training program and um, you were recommended and blah, blah, blah. And next thing I know, I was, I, I was in Sacramento becoming a teacher trainer for, for uh, Balanced Body. So it, it all happened very organically. And in my work with Balanced Body, I, I, you know, I did Pilates on tours and started to write my own curriculum. And it was, again, in writing my own curriculum, I actually became a better teacher of teachers you know, so always stretching a little bit into a space so that when you come into the, into that, that educational environment, like I said, you're providing just enough curiosity for the next question to inspire teachers to, to think a little bit differently beyond or a little bit beyond the movement sequence. And then as it turns out, you know, I'm now in my studio for many years and I'm doing the teacher trainings for many years. And I've had this connection with Balanced Body, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time. My, my clients all are growing up with me. They've all, we all started, they all had babies. At this point now, their kids are graduating, and they're, you know, they're moving on in their lives. And I was thinking, you know, is this time for a transition? And no sooner did I think it than uh, Al Harrison and Nora St. John called me and said, you know, we're looking at expanding in, inside of Sacramento at Balanced Body. Would, would you be interested in joining us? So it, it was it was that organic, and and then a funny thing on that is at one point I changed computers and I was clearing out my old computer and it was one Pilates on tour in Chicago, one evening at about midnight I think the date the timestamp was on it I wrote Nora a letter about what I thought my strengths and weaknesses were and how I could I could support her, and I never emailed it to her. And when I got the phone call and I came in and I interviewed with them and, and Nora, you know, offered me the opportunity to work with her, I opened that email and I looked at it and the job I was starting was basically the job I wrote on that email. So it, it's, it's sort of organically, I think it was like, if intention could create a path, my intention must have done that. <laughs> I was going to say, if like you needed a sign that you were in the right space, like that is it. Holy moly. Yeah, That's incredible. Yeah. Um, did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Like how, yeah. how you got from there to there, point A to point B, you've done it. That's That does answer the question. I'm interested to know how – maybe teacher training programs have changed. You've touched on, you know, it used to mm. be, I mean, it was, I wonder, throwing things out here, that it was similar to almost like yoga teacher training back in the day. You go live yes. with like the master teacher and you like live in their house and like you clean and you just live there and immerse yourself in study, which would be cool, but not really fitting in our schedules as much as it could have in the past. So how have you seen teacher training kind of in general change? If you want to speak about how Balanced Bodies training program has evolved a little bit, you can. 
Yeah, I you know, that, I think that's a that's actually an excellent question. And so, you know, we talked about that f- sort of first transitional period in the in the in Pilates in general. Pilates for a long time was um, you found your master and you worked with your master. And many of the um, original teachers were intuitive movers, found it usually through the dance store or in and around from some kind of a physical modality they would find it. But as it became more and more popular and more and more, pe- more, more people were taking Pilates, were in classes, were in studios, there became a larger demand both for the businesses to have instructors in them and for uh, people who have found and fell in love with Pilates were saying they wanted to explore it more deeply. And so there was a, there was a you know, I would, I would say, you know, really sort of that turn of the century, early 2000s, there was this really big demand that started to, to hit critical mass in need of teachers and teacher trainings sort of were, were blossoming under that. And they started as little, little satellites. You know, you could be somebody who uh, had a thriving practice and you started a small teacher training. And then what ended up happening, there was no sort of linkage of standards and how things organized. So around that, some some of the larger teacher trainings started to pop up. There was um, certainly Polestar, I think, was one of the one of the very first body arts and science. Uh, you know, Bossi, Real, and uh, Nora and Al worked with Ken Endelman here at Balanced Body and started the Balanced Body teacher trainings. The structures went from sort of that loose apprenticeship and requirements with maybe you had tested out, maybe you didn't, to um, being codified either systemically over, like, like I did with physical mind, over X period of time. And then when Balanced Body started, Balanced Body looked at a modular system of taking the reformer program, for example, and and making it three different levels with the intention that that each fit on the other like like Legos, right? And if you want to build something, you, you, you need to put all those pieces together. So it becomes now a journey. And so that that really sort of transformed the industry again, because not only did you create a journey, you created opportunities. Instead of people leaving jobs for weeks on end, they could spend, they can find courses, they could find courses near to where they were, they could study and in between be guided to the next level. So it just dramatically changed the opportunity in the industry. And, and I think most of the larger certifying bodies, they, they may have created their own path. It might have been unique to their requirements. But by and large, we, we all looked at creating opportunity for students to be able to find the education that spoke to them and over time work on building skill until they were autonomous teachers. And so that's, I think, been the biggest change is the accessibility of teacher training and the organization of teacher training, not so much the content inside, but the way in which it is provided to the learner. It's funny that you say that because it's very much the way you would teach someone Pilates. You know, you start with foundational Correct. movements, shapes. You know, this is what a round spine looks like. This is a long spine. This is a back bend. And, you know, how do we put these pieces together? And you can't put pieces together until you have a couple pieces to play with. So it's very much mirroring how you would teach someone Pilates. You know, teaching someone to teach Pilates is, you know, a learning process uh, in its own right. Now we're changing again, though. You, you're, you're in a, you're in this post. We're in this post-COVID period, and we're, we're, we're changing that dial again. We're looking at um, how are people learning today. For example, you know, I always feel like back in the day, you know, now I, f- I feel like that's what I say. But truly, when I started, the man, there were no manuals. You were drawing stick figures. You had little black and white, tiny little black and white thumbnails. Uh, now you have full color manuals with companion videos. 
Uh, but today, and today, uh, the learner learns first the video and maybe comes back and circles back to the written word, right? So we're we're in a online environment. How much do you teach online? Can you teach movement effectively online? At what? Where are the practical junctions? How do you teach hands on? Um, you know, like it, it's it almost feels like it did in those early days of of that structuring and restructuring and experimenting until you sort of find the sweet spot of of how you teach a dynamic modality like Pilates in in the environment that we're in. The part that I worry about is not to forget that Pilates education is a journey. And it's a journey worth taking because there's absolutely a profession out there and one in which whether you're teaching five hours a week or 25 hours a week or 40 hours a week can provide you with opportunity and you're doing something good in the world. But it's a journey to get there and it's okay to honor and respect that journey. And we're in a world that kind of is okay with little bits of this and little bits of that. So again, going back to, don't forget, there's an essence here we don't want to lose. Right, definitely. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, letting go and, you know, releasing our grip on our manuals when you're a new teacher. I was wondering if you had any other advice that you wanted to share to anyone who's maybe coming out of teacher training and is, you know, nervous as we all are and is got their journals with all of their cues and all of their programming written out. Um, what advice could you give that person? Good question. Um, trust yourself. You don't find Pilates by like, and, and, and be able to just be like, eh, you know, like most, most teachers, when they choose to go on their journey and they come out on the other end, this is a conscious choice, right? So uh, you have amassed a lot of information. There are people available to you, you know, people like myself and others who are available now online in ways that were never available before. So there will always be more information that you can acquire. But trust where you are. Know that where you are is enough. And allow yourself to take your client on their journey right? Give them the space to have their, their experience inside of what you know, and just stay curious. Because over your, that will just keep you fresh, keep you desiring a little bit more. Um, and, and the best thing about all the continuing education, don't listen for what you don't know. Let it reinforce who you are and what you do know. Oh, I love that. I just got a little chill because I was like, oh, that's beautiful. That's a, a really beautiful way of thinking about continuing education and just the fact that the learning doesn't stop. You know, there's a reason why you have clients who had done Pilates with you for 27 years who are still invested in it because there's still more to discover. You never right. run out of uh, run things out. to do in Pilates land. I know from making this switch to, you know, how do people learn, having this online content, having videos and more, you know, things available in this post-COVID space sounds like a gigantic project. Um, but is there anything else that you're working on or that you're passionate about? Any last things that you'd love to share? Yeah, the... Um so the last thing, and this is something I want to uh, just let you know about, just in terms of balanced body education, is, is um, for me, for me personally, and um, and I know that behind me is this lovely engine that is balanced body is is in agreement with, is you know the brand that is Pilates, Pilates is um, it's really it's here. And so now we don't have to, we don't have to worry about territory and space. We don't have to worry about who's, who's got all the information because no one has all the information. Uh, um, we can really focus on community and building community and being supportive of each other at whatever level you find, we find each other um, and building resources together 
that continue to move and inspire the brand that is Pilates, which then means we're all we're all moving together into this like open space in front of us. You know, Pilates land is not finite. Pilates is not finite and there's still more to explore and to discover. And what we're working on in terms of our education and our continuing education is become being a community resource, right? We're we're gifted, you know, Ken Endelman is an amazing human. I don't say that because he's sitting in an office next door and he's my boss. He's an amazing human because he's an inventor. He's an, you know, he's inspired by the people that he meets that are are helped and supported and find solace in the work that they do every day by the teachers that are that that we teach and by we I mean the entire Pilates industry I don't mean just Balanced Body um, who use our equipment as platforms to get stronger and healthier and these are all these these just sort of come innately out of him. And it is part of what has driven this particular brand. But this brand supports all brands. It supports a community. And that's, that's, that's really going forward. It's like the leadership in the community and p- bringing it together so that we can all continue to grow is, is, our, is our primary focus. That is fantastic. And that is definitely, you know, the Pilates community that I want to be a part of, a community that uplifts, that provides resources, that, you know, shares the knowledge, lets us all benefit from it. Because more people teaching Pilates, more people doing Pilates is better for everyone, for the world. Like the world's a better place when I do Pilates. 100%. <laughs> My partner's 100%. definitely liking me more when I do Pilates, <laughs> you know, and, and it's those little changes, you know, we we, they've done experiments on like, you know, one good deed or one nice thing and the ripple yes. effect that it has. Yeah. And, you know, Pilates can be that. It is in my life for sure. 100%. And I'm totally with you. I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, and that's our focus. That's our focus. Our, fo- our focus is, 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 you know, instructor to instructor, instructor to client, and and even just to sort of the the lay person out there who's wondering how to how to feel well in their own physical being like this is what this whole entire community is about and and that's exciting i just think that's hugely exciting Joy, it has been an absolute treat being able to chat with you um i'm really excited to share our conversation with listeners because it's amazing. And I feel like my job's even more amazing because I just get to talk to really cool people. Who I like love it. your job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love whenever there's a conversation, I'm like, oh, great. I can let someone just share how amazing they are in their corner of the world because it's fabulous. So thank you so, so much for uh, taking the time and coming on. And oh, Olivia, thank you story. for having me for sure. Um, it's It's kind of fun to talk about this stuff. But, you know, you don't it, it, it's funny because as a teacher, like I don't normally just talk about myself and I, I have to think about those things like, oh, where did this all come from? Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much. Thanks for listening to this week's chapter of Pilates Teacher's Manual, your guide to becoming a great Pilates teacher. Check out the podcast Instagram at Pilates Teachers Manual and be sure to subscribe wherever you listen. For more Pilates goodness, check out my other podcast, Pilates Students Manual, available everywhere you listen to podcasts. The adventure continues. Until next time.